Okay, Senate Finance take two. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We are here uh, with the fantastic members of the Senate Finance Committee for two briefings today. First, we are going to have a briefing from the Maryland Health Care Commission. Um, we have the commission, uh, the executive director here, if you want to come forward and introduce your panel or whoever you've brought with you, they're welcome to join you at the table. I think I have a David Sharp and a Paul Parker. Am I correct? All righty. Good afternoon, gentlemen. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I am Ben Steffen, uh, Executive Director of the Maryland Health Care Commission. On my right is... Uh, Mr. Steffen, if we can ask you to pull the mic a little bit closer. On my right is David Sharp, who is the uh, Director of Health Information Technology and Advanced Care Delivery at the Health Care Commission. And on my left is Paul Parker, who is uh, the Director of Health Facility Planning at MHCC. I might add, we also have two other uh, directors. Uh, one uh, is ch uh, Director for Analysis and Information Systems. Uh, and. Uh, the last, uh, Teresa Lee, uh, directs our quality measurement and reporting uh, project. I uh, hope to have those come before you at some point in the, uh, during the session. Uh, what I wanted to do today, my task is relatively brief. I have three or four slides I'm going to uh, run through. Uh, and talk about generally the Health Care Commission overall. Uh, the bulk of the, of the discussion today will focus on our telehealth initiatives uh, as well as our authority over health facility planning. Uh, you know, basic information that perhaps you've seen before, our vision is to plan for health system needs, promote informed decision making, increase accountability of the system, and improve access in our rapidly changing health environment by providing timely and accurate information on access, cost, and quality of services to all stakeholders in the healthcare system. Uh, mentioned before, we're organized uh, according to our responsibilities, uh, Center for Health Facility Planning. Uh, it's a team that Paul leads, uh, Center for Health Information Technology and Advanced Care Delivery, uh, a team that David Sharp leads, and the other two centers, Analysis and Information Systems, uh, are focused on the development of some of the large uh, medical care uh, databases that the Commission uh, develops uh, through the collection of, of uh, insurance claims from Medicare, Medicaid, and the private market. And lastly, a very ambitious quality initiative in which we report on hospitals, nursing homes, uh, home health home health centers, hospices, uh, as well as assisted living uh, and urgent care centers. Interestingly, uh, although we have detailed quality information for hospitals, nursing homes, hospices, and home health, the area where we see uh, enormous uh, interest today uh, is in assisted living. There's descriptive information uh, that we report on assisted living, but the federal government uh, and various national quality uh, quality measurement uh, initiatives haven't yet focused on quality quality in assisted living facilities. So we provide what we can collect, but uh, as you pause and think about it, it probably makes sense that unlike other services where you have a trusted health care provider to advise you, uh, oftentimes when you're selecting assisted living, you're probably uh, very much uh, on your own. We're here before the uh, Senate Finance Committee and uh, the, the House Government Operations Committee uh, frequently because I think uh, in Maryland government we have some uh, very unique roles. It's a function of our broad uh, statute, uh, but we plan for health facility uh, development, measure and aggregate 
uh, cost and quality information. We enable uh, information technology, and you'll hear about telehealth today, but we have a broad spectrum and a perspective on the evolution of the health information technology uh, biosphere, if you will, that we are working uh, across the board on multiple dimensions uh, to, uh, to bring health information technology fully to uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, repeatedly across all these responsibilities, we seek to engage uh, and convene uh, stakeholders, uh, and we uh, value and appreciate the uh, trust the legislature puts in us in terms of considering and assessing uh, health policy options. The Healthcare Commission uh, goes through a four-year cycle of looking at strategic priorities. Uh, and I know many of you are with private firms uh, in your off days uh, uh, and have probably gone through a strategic planning exercise uh, in, those, in those organizations. We don't focus uh, uh, on strategic priorities quite the same way because we recognize the legislature and our colleagues in, in state government and, and the governor's office as well uh, set our specific priorities. But we think it's important to send signals uh, to all of our stakeholders in the directions we're going. Uh, over the previous four years, uh, we set the following uh, five priorities to educate and inform the health community uh, in our activities to uh, make MHCC a trusted source of quality and cost information, to modernize the CON program, and to align it better with the, uh, the very important Maryland total cost of care model, to enable uh, not just large health systems, but smaller providers uh, across the state of Maryland to participate uh, in value-based uh, payment models, uh, in models in which uh, they are, act they are uh, increasingly being asked to to uh, shoulder uh, both up and downside risk to demonstrate that they can produce uh, a, a, a broader range of effective outcomes uh, on the care they deliver uh, and, and really uh, lead to a more cost-effective healthcare system overall. All the providers are not at the same place in terms of their ability to adopt these models, uh, but they, these models are increasingly going to be the, uh, the framework for how health care reimbursement and value are determined in the future. And lastly, uh, a key, um, a key um, priority, uh, you might say prescient, you might also say accidental, that in 2019 we focused on uh, expanding the use of telehealth. Uh, one might argue that the COVID-19 intervened to make that uh, extremely important, uh, but uh, it was an activity that, that really preceded the Healthcare Commission's involvement in COVID response uh, as we addressed and promoted telehealth. We are on the verge of releasing our priorities for uh, 2023 through 2026. Uh, they have not yet been accepted by the Commission. Uh, broadly, they're going to uh, more specifically focus on health equity across our entire set, our entire agenda. Uh, we will focus more broadly on expansion of health information technology as well. And we hope to share that with the committee uh, after the Commission's uh, February Commission meeting on June 16th. I just wanted to highlight a few things that we are doing uh, in terms of those priorities uh, and, and talk about you know, some of the efforts that were, uh, were launched as a result of legislative action in 2022. Uh, I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. Uh, some of you are directly involved in them. Others uh, you may uh, recall from your action last uh, session that these were priorities of the commission, I mean the, uh, the legislature, uh, and we took took them on uh, very seriously over the recess uh, and, and the fall and look forward to bringing them to con some of them to conclusion uh, later this year. Uh, one that's dear to my heart uh, is the formation of a primary care investment workforce work group. Uh, that has uh, begun and, and we had our second meeting uh, just last night. Uh, the goal is to have a report to the legislature at the conclusion of this year in terms of direction, in terms of how we are both defining 
primary care, and most importantly, uh, investment levels that we think are appropriate uh, and mechanisms to how that might be measured moving forward. The health secretary uh, did offer, ask us to become engaged in a, a health worker workplace violence study. That report uh, focused on uh, a public awareness campaign. Uh, the report has been uh, released by the secretary. It was done with the collaboration of the Maryland Health Care Commission, uh, as well as the Maryland Patient Safety Center, which uh, the, this committee generously supported uh, in uh, obtaining a $1 million appropriation for the Patient Safety Center to support its initiatives going forward. Uh, last year, uh, much of the work focused on, uh, on establishing opportunities for providers to participate uh, on two-sided value-based uh, programs. Uh, the commission was given a, a responsibility to uh, collect information on these programs, particularly as it relates to uh, efficiency and value. Uh, we have met with uh, payers and providers uh, and aligned an initiative that moving forward will be, enable us to uh, make those, uh, draw those conclusions on the effectiveness and quality of these uh, value-based programs uh, moving forward. And lastly, two areas uh, that I think are are uh, evolving as we move through as we move through the pandemic, the uh, the uh, coverage and expansion and use of palliative care services. The commission has embarked on a study uh, with a work group on how the, the services ought to be expanded and what are the opportunities for reimbursement for this uh, important service. And lastly, uh, the, the uh, legislature asked us to look at the regulatory oversight uh, that applies to smaller assisted living facilities. Those are with 10 uh, beds or less, uh, nine beds, uh, nine, nine or more beds, nine or fewer beds, excuse me. Uh, we've launched that work group. Uh, there are, I think, some important um, challenges associated with this, the oversight of these small facilities, and we look forward to having a, having a report to you in terms of the appropriate regulatory framework as well as the appropriate information that we should make available to consumers. As I said at the outset, there's a hunger for information on some of these you know, quasi healthcare facilities. I think most people would say um, assisted living, not a, not a nursing home certainly, but certainly uh, medical services are provided within the umbrella of an assisted uh, 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 living stay. And it's important for us to make sure that consumers have information that assists them in making the choice because they are increasingly uh, you know, uh, seeking this type of care. And oftentimes there's limited information available. Lastly, the two, inf the two uh, important uh, initiatives that I also want to highlight focus on uh, converting our health information exchange, CRISP, to a broader health information instrument, what we uh, and what the industry is calling a health data utility that integrates uh, information collected in clinical settings, shares that information across the uh, across patients treating uh, frame environment, as well as makes, making that information appropriately for uh, decision makers, uh, particularly in the area of public health. Uh, the Maryland uh, initiatives are really in the forefront of this, uh, this effort nationally, and we look forward uh, to providing our perspective perspective on the evolution of the health data utility moving forward. We are fortunate uh, to have uh, CRISP uh, supporting uh, clinicians as well as policymakers and the public health community. And I'm proud to say that the Health Care Commission, in its role as the designator of a health information exchange, uh, takes the responsibility of ensuring that, that CRISP performs uh, effectively across the entire spectrum of its broadening uh, 
set of responsibilities. And lastly, uh, we've worked with providers and payers to, uh, to develop a framework for uh, uh, advanced directives, particularly focused on electronic advanced directives. I'm happy to say that there's the electronic framework that you talked about in last year's bill has been established at CRISP, uh, and we have provided a set of, of one-page uh, information uh, documents that are, are distributed across a wide <coughs> range of uh, platforms, both public and private, to assist uh, consumers in, uh, in uh, understanding the importance of advanced directives and the mechanisms in which they can use uh, to develop that. I want to recognize Senator Kramer, Kramer for his leadership in this initiative, uh, and we look forward uh, to working with payers uh, moving forward. And lastly, just uh, to toot our own horn, I'm not going through this uh, extensively, but to point out uh, in November uh, through January of this year, uh, there's about a dozen uh, important reports that we've released, uh, many of them uh, at the direction uh, of, the, of the legislature last year, uh, or uh, a a binding obligation that exists in our statute, for example, the trauma fund. Uh, I will stop here uh, briefly for questions, but uh, I want to give our team on telehealth and CON ample time. Uh, so thank you very much. Look forward to uh, working with you over, over the next uh, 90 days as well as into the future. Thank you very much for that. Senator Reedy. I was actually, you just said tele, uh, CON, so someone else is going to talk a little bit more about CON, because I was curious what progress we're making on the point you made about CON and modernizing it, so I'll, I'll just hold that question until, uh, thank you. Uh, I think, until I, think I hear from you. You'll thank be very you. impressed with what Mr. Parker tells you, but, you know, there's always more to do. Thank you. All right. Well, I don't see, uh, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you, sir, for your testimony. So looking at uh, page two of the slide presentation, um, it talks about uh, you have the Center for Healthcare Facilities Planning and Development. And so I'm just interested in, uh, in my uh, district, Charles County, District 28, um, tremendous growth mm -hmm. over the last 15 years. And um, We've had no health care expansion from our hospital, say, in um, La Plata. Um, a lot of constituents in regular times, uh, car accidents that would be taken outside of the county by ambulance to another nearby facility. Um, outside of when you expect like surges to happen. So uh, how involved is your agency in assessing Population growth needs, not just in my district, but throughout the state where other communities are growing fast, and be proactive in saying, uh, well, we need expanded facilities. So, uh, so thank you, Senator, Senator Ellis. Uh, and I think, and sort of clicking through my head in terms of what expansion there has been in Charles County, I think you're right about the, the hospital, of course, you know, Prior to the pandemic, you know, the focus was on, on uh, stabilizing or, in some instances, reducing hospital beds. Uh, I have not heard of anything that, uh, that uh, the hospital in Charles County is planning to do in terms of any expansions. They are part of the University of Maryland medical system, as you know. Uh, the, the system is, is expanding in a number of, of uh, jurisdictions in, in Maryland, but I, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on any plans that uh, the University of Maryland has for, for the hospital in, in Charles County. In terms of other services, uh, we're certainly uh, aware of, of um, opportunities that may exist for uh, nursing homes, but you know, frankly, there's not been a significant amount of interest in nursing home expansion, it's been uh, acquisitions by uh, entities, uh, some already in the state, some uh, coming in from out of state that we're paying a special uh, attention to. In terms of the key issue, which I think is workforce, uh, that's a broader challenge. And 
typically Southern Maryland does have more challenges with physician and other healthcare provider supply. We don't have direct authority in that area, but we, along with other state agencies, are working you know, to deal with the broader um, healthcare workforce crisis that exists across the state, but is particularly challenging yeah. uh, in rural areas of the yeah. state. Yeah, and uh, it's, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the uh, workforce challenges. Uh, the issue in rural areas is uh, reimbursements, right? You say you're a rural area, and I know from Medicare, Medicaid, it's less than, say, if you go maybe one mile up over the border into Prince George's County, which is urban, mm -hmm. you know, so why would someone move south and open a practice? So are there any solutions to that uh, particular problem uh, that you might have come so, across? Or so, I mean, I think... Uh, you know, this is, that's a long, this is a long answer, but in terms of workforce, I think we have to really look at the entire supply chain and, you know, the medical schools, you know, will, will tell you, you know, obviously that, you know, we want to maintain very high academic standards. You know, what I would point the, the committee to is in some states, one that comes to mind, uh, in particular California, there's a very ambitious uh, post-baccalaureate program for less qualified and oftentimes uh, minority uh, students or students that just you know, are not necessarily as well prepared, but be, might be better suited in terms of serving uh, particularly uh, in primary care. And I think we have to look at some of these programs to try to enable uh, slightly different sets of, of students uh, to have access to medical school, number one. Number two, I think we have to look carefully at where we're training physicians. Um, Tom Ricketts from the University of North Carolina School of Public Health has this kind of catchy tune, which is doctors go where doctors are. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's, uh, we have plenty of doctors not, you know, uh, not necessarily always you know, appropriately distributed in large urban communities like uh, Baltimore City, the county, Montgomery County. Uh, but it's very hard to get uh, move physicians into areas where there aren't already a lot of physicians, and we have to address that. One of the ways we can address that is thinking about where we establish residency programs. Now, we want to be very mindful of in order to have an effective residency program, you have to have an effective set of, of experienced uh, physicians to, uh, to, to, to provide the appropriate training. But I think we have to look more broadly at just distributing these residency programs. Rotations into rural communities, and you, uh, uh, Senator Hershey might might talk about that. Rotations of physicians, of, of residents into rural communities helps a little bit, but you really want to, uh, have residents uh, think about establishing roots, and rotations don't really do that. Putting residency programs in in uh, strong community hospitals in rural areas could make a difference. And then I'll rest on what I said. I think it's important that we think about, you know, attracting a slightly different set of uh, highly qualified students to the field of medicine. Um, and it, there are some prof promising uh, initiatives already underway with the, with the potential school of osteopathic medicine at Morgan State uh, and potentially a medical school uh, in Hagerstown under the umbrella of the Meritus Health System. Those are very optimistic signs to me that we're not only uh, thinking about uh, what's appropriate in less urban areas, but also studying in place a framework for attack, mm -hmm. attracting mm -hmm. a slightly different set of students. Could I follow up with one? She's in. She's in. <laughs> oh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, listening to what you're saying, uh, I think it kind of didn't sink in. So you were saying something about uh, the medical profession attracting less qualified folks and moving them into the rural areas. No, uh, I'm saying, I'm not I'm clear saying about that. you know, basically uh, there is a pre-med curriculum, uh, and you know, let's take a political scientist, you know, probably wouldn't be qualified, and what has been done in, in California is a post-graduation baccalaureate program 
particularly aimed at attracting students that wouldn't otherwise consider medicine to come into the program and then uh, they uh, successful, they can qualify as um, uh, for, for uh, admission to a medical school. Okay, so they move from, a, I would like to use the term unprepared status into a very prepared status that will to enable them go to into qualify. medical school. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions at this point? Okay, <laughs> we'll proceed with the rest of the panel. Okay, um, everyone can hear me well, I hope. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here before you to present on the telehealth uh, report, telehealth study. So um, telehealth has come a long way since it, 1964 when providers at the University of Nebraska established a two-way television setup linked with a state hospital to perform video consultations. Fast forward to 2020, where executive orders issued in response to the COVID-19 pandemic pushed telehealth to the forefront in care delivery. Payers rapidly expanded telehealth coverage, diffusion among providers occurred quickly, and consumers' adoption of telehealth skyrocketed. Post-COVID-19 public health emergency, stakeholders recognized that telehealth should remain a feature of care delivery. The Preserve Telehealth Access Act of 2021 maintains the existing coverage and reimbursement established during the COVID-19 public health emergency and requires MHCC to study the impact of telehealth as it relates to the use of audio-only and audiovisual technologies in somatic and behavioral health interventions. The study yielded 15 recommendations as it relates to telehealth coverage, technology payment levels, and future study terms and statute, and network adequacy. <clears throat> this slide provides an overview of the work and engagement of stakeholders. Over 1,000 responses to a provider survey, 78 structured interviews with English and Spanish-speaking Maryland consumers, two focus group sessions with behavioral health subject matter experts from provider and consumer organizations, a telehealth claims analysis using Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial claims, a literature review that examines the impact of telehealth on access, utilization, and cost, and two town hall events with payers and providers. Stakeholders were notified about a study webpage where routine updates would be posted. We invited stakeholders to subscribe to receive push notifications. Roughly 45 stakeholders uh, um, participated in the uh, notification process, which was a blend of, of subscribers and organizations. So now we'll move on to the recommendations. Our first recommendation, coverage, is continue to allow use of telehealth by any health care provider licensed, certified, or otherwise authorized under the health occupation articles to provide health care in the ordinary course of business or practice of a profession or in an approved education or training program, or for interpersonal consultation. The uh, bullet points that follow w underneath of each of the recommendations is a snippet of the rationale, if you're interested to take a look at those as I proceed. The second recommendation, allow a healthcare provider capable of providing telehealth services using audiovisual technology to deliver services using audio-only technology. Allow users of audio-only technology for somatic care in the event that audiovisual technology fails. A request by the patient or at the clinical discretion of a treating health care provider without requiring documentation in the clinical record. Allow unrestricted use of audio only for behavioral health based on patient consent to receive care via audio only technology. Moving on to the third recommendation. Allow healthcare providers using remote patient monitoring to obtain consent at the time services are initiated for new and established patients. Allow remote patient monitoring technologies to minimally collect two days of data over a 30 day period. The fourth recommendation allow a healthcare provider to use telehealth to provide hospice care services consistent with their profession standard of care to patients in a facility or nursing home. 
continuation of the coverage recommendations. It's recommendation number five. Allow telehealth services to be furnished in a hospital inpatient setting and a nursing home setting. Require a minimum of at least one in-person visit by any treating physician 24 hours following a telehealth hospital inpatient encounter. Require an in-person visit by any treating physician at least once every 30 days for the first 90 days after admission and at least every 60 days thereafter in a nursing home. Recommendation number six, require healthcare providers to utilize communication technologies that complies with privacy and security requirements established by the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to qualify as a telehealth distance site. Now we'll move on to the payment levels in future study. Recommendation number seven, continue payment levels for telehealth services relative to in-person care for 24 months. Require MHCC to study payment parity for audiovisual and audio-only technologies and submit a report to the Maryland General Assembly by December 1st, 2024 that addresses the following. Does it cost more or less for providers to deliver telehealth? Does telehealth require more or less clinical effort for a provider? Are there aspects of telehealth that yield lower value, overuse, or conversely, greater value that inform the debate on payment parity? The adequacy of reimbursement for behavioral health care services delivered in person or by telehealth. And lastly, any other findings and recommendations. Moving on. So we have a set of terms that we proposed in the recommendations for clarification. I want to point out that they're not shown here as a replacement to what's in statute today, but rather consideration for clarification. The first term, behavioral health, includes health and substance use conditions, life stressors and crisis, stress-related physical symptoms, and health behaviors. Next term. Communication-based technology services includes a variety of non-face-to-face -face patient care communications such as two-way audio-only telephone interactions, remote evaluation of patient videos and images, virtual check-ins, e-visits, and remote patient monitoring. Recommendation 10, established patient means an individual who receives professional health care services from a provider or another provider who belongs to the same practice within the previous three years. Number 11, telehealth consent means an affirmation received prior to or upon initiation of a telehealth encounter from the patient, family member, or caregiver for an audio, video, or audio only encounter and documented in the patient record. And the last term proposed for clarification is telehealth. Includes the delivery of medically necessary somatic dental or behavioral health services to a patient at an originating site by a distance site provider through communication technologies that includes the use of audio only or audio visual technology to permit real time interactive communications. So I'm going to move on to the section that was informed by the Maryland Insurance Administration. Um, we have three recommendations here from them. The MIA was required by the Act to conduct a limited scope study, how telehealth can support efforts to ensure healthcare provider network sufficiency, the impact of changes in access to and coverage of telehealth services under health benefit plans offered by the health insurance carriers on the ability of consumers to choose in-person care versus telehealth care as the modality of receiving covered services. So let's take a look at the three recommendations that the MIA proposed. Allow the MIA to retain the latitude currently granted by the legislature under the insurance article, which states, and I'm taking snippets, in adopting the network sufficiency regulation, the commissioner may take into consideration other health care services delivery options, including telehealth. And number 14, consider whether to permanently codify telehealth coverage expansion for health benefit plans into state law. And the last recommendation here is consider whether to codify additional prohibitions on telehealth only benefits or telehealth first benefits for health benefit plans into state law. 
And before I open it up and return back to the chair for questions, I would just like to note all the stakeholders that provided input into developing and formulating the recommendations and the time they provided us over the, the study period. They were enormously guiding and contributed a lot of intellectual input and guidance to staff and the contractor. So there are by far too many to note, but some of them are actually in the room today and watching. So um, Madam Chair and Senators, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you um, for this briefing on, on telehealth. Um, there, there is a lot here. I mean, it's very dense, even for someone in the healthcare field to kind of pick up all of these recommendations, you know, all at once. And and um, my question, I guess, is, is a bit of a clarification. It says that there's going to be a report issued to the General Assembly at the end of 2024, I think. But it looks like there are some, are these interim recommendations that have been kind of gone through the process already, or, or what are some of these other recommendations? The, it looks like the interim report is focusing on payment, which is obviously the more complicated piece of all of this. Um, some of the other pieces are more policy-based pieces. Is, are you looking to suggest that these recommendations, uh, particularly on the policy end, be something that we as a legislature consider, and then subsequently, once the report comes out on the payment mechanism, for us to look at that. So, um, Senator Lamb, thank you for that question. So there are two ways I will go about addressing it. First is that there's a report that came out at the beginning of January, which was supplied to the, the General Assembly called the Preserve Access, Telehealth Access Act of 2021, Telehealth Recommendations. And in that, the, the 15 recommendations that I highlighted, it, it explains how we arrived at it, provides rationale for the, each of the recommendations. And one of the recommendations, which uh, Dr. Lamb, you noted, was an, uh, on the payment, an additional study. So the, what the recommendation suggests is that the continued uh, coverage would, would go into the future, but what would be a, an additional study is on the payment side of the equation. And that would come out in 2024. So the, the idea was to extend what exists today until um, to the end of 2024, and then at that time, uh, you would also have pay a report on the payment, sir, on how that should be adjusted, if any adjustments. So the coverage extension while we figure out the payment piece of this, would it, right? Would go on more till the end of 2024 if is the there, recommendations are adopted. Is there any action needed on the coverage piece to make sure that this will continue on while we figure out the payment piece due at the end of 2024? So ideally, they both would go concurrently being extended for the 24 months. The, the addition of the the payment side of the equation, we would have a report and recommendations at the end of that time period, which could, would drive whether or not the, uh, the coverage would go on into the future, essentially being made permanent. So uh, the, cover the coverage provisions that have existed throughout the public health emergency uh, will continue. Uh, for even even with the ceasing of the public, whenever well, the pu this would require action on the part of the General Assembly to continue it uh, beyond, I, I believe it is June of 2023. That in order to continue the coverage uh, recovery expansions, uh, we need legislation to um, to continue that. The study on the reimbursement, which was uh, in this phase of of this endeavor, we didn't look at. Uh, what we're saying is continue the, the, the waivers on telehealth use, audio, uh, audio only, audio vi uh, video uh, coverage would continue consistent with the way it's been for the last three years. Uh, and in the meantime, we would look at uh, long term what the appropriate reimbursement levels uh, for audio, video, telehealth and audio only might be. And thus, the need for a two-year extension uh, uh, on the authority to uh, uh, on on the continuation of the waivers. I guess I'll put it that way. So, so we need to. It sounds like in this session, extend the coverage through to the end of 2024. I assume there's already a bill. I believe there's, uh, the Health Care Commission does not have a bill yet. We understand we are uh, working with stakeholders uh, to put a. a uh, legislative language together to uh, to align with what we've said today. Okay. 
And if we don't pass something this session, the coverage will cease when the public health emergency ceases, right? It would, it would cease in June of 2023. Right. June 30th. Right. In, in like five or six months. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, the, uh, my other question has to do with um, the telehealth piece about capturing patient choice when it comes to determining network adequacy. It sounds like the insurance administration is moving towards removing that requirement. Um, you know, what's, what's the, the, the commission's kind of consideration on this, that if, if that were removed, if that requirement were removed, um, how would we be able to capture kind of patient choice when it comes to determining network adequacy? So, um, Senator, I don't think that's what they're intending to do. I think what they're actually trying to do is to ensure that consumers have the choice. So, there, so MIA is looking to make sure that consumers Consumer still voice have is heard. Yes, sir. the choice um, and so that that would be captured when they're determining network adequacy. That's correct. Okay. Um, one of the recommendations here states that uh, that the legislature should extend the sunset for, I guess, 24 months pending further study. Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious to hear if there's any consideration to just extending the, the study permanently um, and then changing the, the purview or the, the considerations of the study as needed rather than having to sunset it every two years. So um, I can start and then yield to our executive director. It's the, the study is to look at data on claims to answer questions around cost, perhaps quality, efficiency, if you will. And today, um, the claim data is limited, which not only in Maryland, but nationally is the case. So the purpose of the study is to have time to accumulate more data to make the comparisons and make a recommendation. Um, it wasn't necessarily say we would, it would, needs to be studied incrementally every two years. I think, like most services, they're always looked at but it isn't a designated study, and I would yield to our executive yeah, director. Think, uh, thank you, David. I think <laughs> you answered the, uh, the question. Uh, what I would add is, yeah, we're not advocating for a two-year, two-year, two-year. We're saying that to look at reimbursement, we would need two additional y years, we think. Uh, but you know, there are a number of factors playing out here. The, the response of the federal government, they too have signaled uh, that in terms of telehealth, they're looking at how uh, long term after the cessation of the, the public health emergency, uh, what Medicare would do. So I think we're kind of in line with what uh, the federal government uh, and other states uh, are also looking at in terms of, of uh, how, how they align their Medicaid and commercial markets with what what uh, CMS is doing as it regulates Medicare uh, and co-regulates co the Medicaid program uh, as well. But I would definitely not advocate for this two-year renewal process into the future. I think we have to decide where telehealth, both audio and audio video fit in the whole, in the constellation of healthcare modalities that we use. Okay. I mean, I think I think just one consideration of thought is to, to um, you know, extend the, 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 the review kind of indefinitely, because the reimbursement piece is not going to go away, I think. It, it's just, there's going to be changes to it, and we're going to constantly have to look at that, um, rather than having to come back every two years to either extend it or kind of re-stand it back up again. So just, just a thought. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Beidel, are you trying to get, there you go. Right, thank you. Am I up? Sure. Thank uh -huh. you, Madam Chair. Just as we look forward to um, the discussion, are we talking about requiring any in-person visits at all, or a doctor could always do telehealth and never do in-person visits? So let me try to break that apart. So f the study focuses strictly on telehealth visits. There is, it isn't making any recommendations to um, restricting or promoting one modality over the other. In fact, the MIA's portion says specifically that it, they, they suggest not allowing insurance carriers to, to just offer a service for telehealth. They'd rather it be um, no change so that you can have in-person care. So that was one of the recommendations. Are we looking at 
the possibility of doctors being out of state and providing services in state with telehealth? Is that part of the study? So um, there's a second leg to the study. We were asked by the HGO committee uh, chair last session to do an additional review of interstate telehealth and the impact. And that's, that work is underway and concludes at the end of this year. During the pandemic, most states allowed for um, you know, what you might call out-of-state or interstate telehealth. But there are many challenges, not unique to Maryland, but nationally um, from the provider and payer side that need to be addressed. And that's what the, uh, we were tasked to do in the off session. Thank you. Thank you, Senators. I, Senator Guile. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you for this presentation. You mentioned earlier that the process involves figuring out where telehealth fits in the healthcare modalities. Do you have recommendations as far as where telehealth does indeed fit among the different types of medical specialties, where, where it's most appropriate? A very good question, Senator. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think where telehealth has really ta you know, taken root uh, is in behavioral health. Mm -hmm. uh, and we encountered over the course of the study the strongest support for continuation of both uh, audio video uh, and uh, audio only services among the uh, behavioral health community. I think that's an important uh, underutilized service today that you know, telehealth can, can prop up, if you will, uh, the delivery of behavioral health services. Uh, I think that it does have, in conjunction with face-to-face uh, -face visits, a role to play in uh, ongoing treatment of chronic conditions. Uh, we did generate, we did uh, encounter less, uh, less support or less enthusiasm for it in specialty care, as one might expect where surgical inter interventions are you know, the uh, major uh, course of treatment. Uh, there, the providers responded during the, the pandemic, but uh, that use of that modality really dropped off during the uh, post uh, <coughs> period we're in now where mm -hmm. we're not absolutely locked down. So I would pick uh, behavioral health and primary care, particularly as it focuses on the care for individuals with chronic conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, I guess, uh, you know, to follow up on Senator Beidel's question earlier is that in behavioral health care, then there would have to be an expectation for periodic in-person visits then, right? And do you make recommendations, I think, for d different areas of health care? Uh, it's is because I would ha I would have to expect that you know if somebody's receiving care for a chronic heart condition there would be a requirement for more in person visits versus telehealth whereas perhaps for behavioral health it, it could be more regularly right by telehealth so are there varying recommendations for that yes first off I want to say a little angel came and whispered <laughs> in my ear that said uh, <laughs> health <laughs> occupations requires uh, face to face to face visits David okay, I think we thank you. I think we talked on uh, Senator Bidel's question, but in terms of uh, you, the thought is that telehealth just doesn't go on and on. And in particular settings, particularly hospitals and nursing homes, we have a call out mm -hmm. on how frequently face-to-face uh, -face visits need to occur. Okay, thank you. I think we call that phone a friend, right? <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions on this topic? Um, just before we move off of telehealth, I do know that some members have a copy of the report and others may not have received that as they're new to the committee. So we should make arrangements to get that report we'll to, see that to the committee. And thanks so much. Okay, we have, I think, Mr. Parker left. Is that correct? Thank you. You can proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm going to take a few slides here to give you a, an overview of Certificate of Need regulation uh, in brief. Uh, as we note on the first slide, uh, Certificate of Need regulation is 50 years old. So it's a uh, mature regulatory program. The law has changed a lot over the years. There's been an accretion of lots of different uh, 
nuance and caveats. So this is going to be a fairly high level uh, overview of the program. CO1 regulation primarily involves review and approval or disapproval of capital projects by healthcare facilities uh, and the introduction of a limited number of new services by healthcare facilities. Approval generally is uh, based on a few key criteria. Uh, we look for any project to demonstrate that it's needed by the public it serves, that it is uh, a cost-effective alternative. Uh, it's the most cost-effective alternative among choices. That the project is viable over the long term. And of course, that, that leads us to look at the, the viability of the overall healthcare facility that is proposing the project. And that it has an acceptable, acceptable impact. And then finally, the Maryland Healthcare Commission develops specific regulations for specific categories of project. And so we look for proposed projects to demonstrate that they're consistent with the specific standards in those state health plan regulations. There's an error in the third bullet there. Uh, there's actually uh, the most recent chapter of state health plan regulation that we uh, updated for psychiatric hospital services is COMAR 10-24-21 but there are not actually 21 chapters of state health plan regulation. There are 15, and then the first uh, set of regulations under that title, 1024-01, uh, are the procedural regulations that govern uh, health facilities oversight by the commission, and we'll touch on those in a moment. So the types of healthcare facilities that are regulated under CON, hospitals, that's general hospitals and special hospitals, freestanding <laughs> medical facilities, which are uh, probably uh, maybe more, more uh, easily uh, identified as freestanding emergency medical facilities. They're operated by hospitals essentially as satellite emergency departments, nursing homes, residential treatment centers, which are behavioral health facilities for adolescents and children, larger ambulatory surgical facilities. So uh, we only regulate ambulatory surgical facilities with three or more sterile operating rooms. Uh, that's a, a change uh, that's occurred in recent years uh, that we'll talk about in a moment. Alcoholism and drug abuse intermediate care facilities. Uh, these are facilities that provide what the American Society for Addictions Medicine calls uh, intensive inpatient treatment. So they're, they're inpatient treatment facilities below the level of acute hospital care. So it's a relatively narrow spectrum of the total uh, 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 range of addictions treatment facilities. Home health agencies, general hospices. And then a few specific services regulated under CON, so facilities would need certificate of need approval to introduce these as new services, medical rehabilitation, neonatal intensive care, cardiac surgery, percutaneous coronary intervention, also known as angioplasty, organ transplantation, and burn intensive care. So what requires a CON? Again, in general, you require a CON to establish a new healthcare facility, to relocate an existing healthcare facility, to change the bed capacity or operating room capacity of a healthcare facility, to introduce new services, and again, that's a relatively uh, short list, and to make a hospital capital expenditure of $50 million, the lesser of $50 million, or 25% of the hospital's budgeted revenue. CON regulates uh, home health agencies and hospices, which are obviously not facilities that are involved in brick and mortar types of capital projects. 
we regulate their service areas. So we, we approve jurisdictions that can be served by home health agencies or hospices. So in 2018, uh, MHCC uh, issued a report called Modernization of the Maryland CON Program. We had a large task force that assisted the Maryland Health Care Commission in developing a modernization plan. And though that report led to uh, the following changes in 2019. Uh, we eliminated capital expenditure thresholds as a basis for requiring CONs for all healthcare facilities other than hospitals. Uh, they existed uh, for all healthcare facilities at, at prior to that change. We eliminated the need for CON approval to add beds at the alcoholism and drug abuse ICFs and also uh, at general hospices. Uh, some hospices do operate their own inpatient hospice facilities. They are now no longer required to get CON approval to develop their own inpatient facility or to expand it. We increased the capital expenditure threshold for hospital CONs. That was approximately $16 million prior to 2019. We, uh, we now have the, the standard or threshold that I just mentioned, the lesser of $50 million or 25% of GBR. And importantly, that's consistent with a capital policy developed by HSCRC, the agency that regulates hospital charges. Uh, and that, that's now, uh, they now have a very similar threshold for considering uh, any extraordinary adjustments to your global budgeted revenue. Uh, so that actually uh, is uh, a change that, by conforming those two, uh, those two agency policies, we, we actually uh, have eliminated some of the projects that used to require CON review in the past. We redefined uh, the regulated sector of ambulatory surgical facilities. Uh, it used to be, and for many years, it was two operating rooms. Once you had two sterile operating rooms, you were a healthcare facility under the CON law and subject to CON. We increased that to three, and that seems like a small change, but that's actually a pretty big change. It, it really, uh, a two OR facility is actually um, quite sufficient for many of the physician groups who operate these types of facilities in Maryland. So it did eliminate uh, uh, quite a few CON reviews that were required in the past. We eliminated the requirement that hospitals attain a CON for any increase in OR capacity, which is what the law used to say in any setting. Hospitals are now on a level playing field with any person in the state in that they can develop a ambulatory surgical facility uh, with two or fewer sterile operating rooms. You don't require a CON to do that. We do require you to get what's called a determination of coverage so that we can actually make sure that the law is being administered in the way it's, it's uh, designed. Uh, but that's pretty much writing us a letter, uh, giving us the detail on your project, and then we send you on to the Department of Health for licensure. And we establish deemed approval for most CON reviews so if we do not have final action by our commission within 120 days of docketing the application, docking an application is determining that it is a complete application, that all the questions on the applicable criteria and standards have been, then have been met. If we don't take action within 120 days, the project is automatically approved. These do not apply to the more complex cases, uh, which often tend to be uh, contested, so that, that deemed approval doesn't apply to new facilities uh, or organ transplantation programs, cardiac surgery programs. Other uh, recent accomplishments of MHC in our regulatory oversight of facilities, we've updated seven chapters of state health plan regulation in the last five years, so we've increased our pace of updating. Um, We've adopted new state health plan regulations that add performance, uh, character, and fitness standards for applicants seeking to establish new nursing homes or home health agencies to add beds. So in order to get docketed now, we're actually using 
the uh, CMS home health uh, and uh, nursing home compare uh, system, which uh, provides star ratings uh, based on safety, quality, and performance of these facilities as a gateway for making uh, these types of projects eligible for review. We've authorized hospitals to establish five new freestanding medical facilities that replace general hospitals in the state. Uh, those have all been implemented now that you see listed there with the exception of the replacement of Harford Memorial Hospital. Uh, that project is underway in Aberdeen, so they will have uh, on a, on a freestanding medical facility campus, they will, they will also have a special psychiatric hospital as part of that project. Uh, we've worked with HSCRC to develop more standardized and coordinated assessment of the financial feasibility of hospital projects uh, in order to, you know, hopefully streamline our review process for hospital projects. And we've implemented the first rounds of ongoing performance review of cardiac surgery and PCI programs in Maryland. This is based on a 2012 change in the law, so it's, it's a bit different from certificate of need review. This is the first uh, area in which the Maryland Healthcare Commission is actually looking at whether these two types of facility programs. We have uh, 11 cardiac surgery programs in the state now, and we have, I believe, 24 PCI programs. Uh, we're looking at whether they are meeting uh, uh, performance and safety standards uh, on an ongoing basis, so we periodically uh, recertify them. And the last slide here, some of the other things that are underway. So the first two are actually uh, leftover business from our modernization uh, project that we started in 2018 to 2019. We anticipate uh, uh, the first comprehensive update of our procedural regulations in many years uh, to be finalized later this year. That process got started last year. Uh, it's a pretty massive process. Uh, we're obviously updating those regulations to reflect changes in statute, but we're also looking uh, closely at where we can eliminate certain procedural requirements or speed them up. We're looking at more opportunities to uh, put, put pressure on ourselves to get things done within certain time frames uh, or else, you know, let, let the uh, projects proceed. We're updating our state health plan chapter for general hospital projects, and that's an opportunity for us to look at further ways in which we can better coordinate our review of projects with what has to take place on the HSCRC side when there are uh, special considerations for how projects will be, hospital projects will be funded. We're taking a look at acquisitions uh, of healthcare facilities which um, is primarily focused on nursing homes. We, we've, uh, we've not, we haven't been building new nursing homes or expanding existing nursing homes in recent years. The use rate for nursing home services has been declining for a couple of decades now. Uh, so the industry is actually contracting gradually over time. Um, and so what really makes a difference in terms of the landscape here in Maryland is primarily acquisitions, and acquisitions are not regulated under CON uh, currently. We do require uh, notice of acquisitions, and we require a minimal uh, types of information. But one of the things that's, uh, that we found and that's highlighting our concern is that we uh, as I mentioned, we now have some performance thresholds in certificate of need review. If you want to build a new nursing home in the state, again, we don't have lots of opportunities, but if you want to, if there is an opportunity and you want to build a new nursing home, or if you want to add beds at your nursing home, we actually have performance requirements. We expect you to show that you're actually uh, performing well under the CMS Nursing Home Compare program before we accept applications for review. And what we're finding is that, you know, most of the 
facilities that are being acquired in Maryland, when we look at the track record of those purchasers who are entering the Maryland market uh, uh, as, as new nursing home operators in some cases, they would not actually have a track record that would qualify them to build a new nursing home or to expand an existing nursing home, which is troubling. So uh, one of the things that uh, our commissioners are going to be looking at is should we be looking at reforming uh, our regulatory oversight in ways that maybe gives us some better control over acquisitions um, and hopefully leads to a better set of nursing home operators down the road. And then finally, we're going to continue to consider ways in which, uh, as, as Ben mentioned, as a new strategic priority focus for the Commission, we're going to continue to look at ways in which our regulatory oversight of healthcare facilities can better address issues of equity and disparities in healthcare and healthcare service delivery. We do a bit of that uh, in some of our state health plan standards already, but we're going to uh, be taking another look every time we update those standards for opportunities to increase health equity. So that concludes uh, my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. I have Senator Kramer first. Thank you, Madam Chair and gentlemen. Thank you for being here today, and you'll forgive my ignorance. This is clearly not my wheelhouse as it is Senator Lamb, so uh, I'm not even sure you are the right folks to be asking a couple of questions, but within a hospital setting, are physicians required to meet certain uh, standards as far as seeing numbers of patients in any given period of time, like monthly, uh, performing X number of procedures in a given month, do those expectations or requirements or standards exist within a hospital setting that you're familiar with? And is there anything to prohibit that? Uh, well, the focus of our regulatory oversight is healthcare facilities. And there are some services that we regulate in which we do have volume standards. So I would say that indirectly, um, so, for example, cardiac surgery. Uh, any new cardiac surgery program, uh, we would expect to uh, have a, a very credible demonstration that they can do at least 200 cardiac surgery cases a year. Um, so, obviously, the hospital, in terms of the cardiac surgeons that it puts together uh, for its uh, surgical staff there, is going to have to take that into consideration. And that's when looking at a certificate of need. Yes. Okay. In, but does this go beyond, does my question go beyond the scope of, I guess you, it does. Yes. Okay. Then I will yes. uh, let that go for another so if, occasion. If, just to, I think, and we haven't, we have not done a systematic review, but uh, large health systems do often have, uh, maybe not in the terms of number of visits, but um, resource requirements and the physician uh, reimbursement system is based on a resource-based relative value scale and uh, RVUs for short and historically uh, health systems would set you have to produce uh, and this is just pulling a number out of my hat uh, 5,000 RVUs a year or you may not you, you may not be viewed as, favor, as favorably by the system. Here in Maryland, as we move from the, to the GBR system, the GBR system is kind of misaligned with just simply producing more. And while I think these requirements to produce uh, output, if you will, uh, still exist, uh, they don't align well with the GBR system that uh, Katie Wonderlich and her team are going to tell you about shortly. And the concern being both burnout and not necessarily the best outcomes for the patients. That's why I yeah. was curious about right. and, that. And I think it does misalign, and we are moving 
into an environment where the payment for value uh, from, the, you know, from the standpoint of, of the payers and purchasers of health care is pushing us away from simply uh, producing more more output for the sake of producing more output. All right, so maybe there will be there. a chance for me to get a better understanding of that uh, as we go along during session. Um, question about the nursing homes, and again, this may or may not be appropriate for you all. Um, anybody tracking uh, sexual assaults in nursing homes, and is anyone tracking the number of convicted sex offenders on the sex offender registry? that reside in nursing homes? Is that a uh, uh, figure that you all would be able to produce or that uh, somebody else may be tracking and could provide that information? I think probably uh, that would best be a question for the Maryland Department of Health and specifically the Office of Healthcare Quality, which is the division within the Department of Health that licenses healthcare facilities. So that's not an area that you all are involved in? Those would be the type of background checks and information that would be part of the licensing process rather than doing project review as we do. Okay, and when you say licensing, I'm not talking about necessarily employees, although that is a very important piece of it, but amongst the residents, um, would that also be the appropriate source to try to get a handle on that information? I think so, yes. Great. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. So, Senators, we're going to hear from Senator Beidle, then Hershey, then the Vice Chair, then Senator Lamb, and Senator Mounts. I'll remind you in just a moment. Senator Beidle. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for your presentation. Mr. Parker, um, I'm pleased to hear that we're going to try to do something about the acquisitions of, of uh, assisted living, of nursing homes, because I know that's been a problem, and I had a bill a couple years ago. Um, so reconsidering the regulatory oversight, I think, is important, and I hope we can follow up on that. I have a question about assisted living. Do we do certificate of needs for assisted living facilities, or anybody can open assisted living? We do not. We do not. Is that something that's been discussed or not? Or um, In my time here, no. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hershey. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Ben, David, Paul, thank you all for your comments. But I wanted to ask a couple questions specifically related to hospices. So um, I thought you said that hospices are regulated through a CON process. Um, but then beds could be added at an existing hospice without the need for a CON. Is that accurate? That's correct. So you would need a CON to establish a right. new general hospice or to change your service area, expand your service area. So if you want to serve a new jurisdiction that you haven't been previously authorized to serve, you would need a certificate of need. Right. And the law says that a change in the bed capacity of a health care facility requires a CON. Under our law, hospices, general hospices, are health care facilities. But uh, as I noted in the presentation a few years ago, we went to the General Assembly and we said we'd like to modify that part of the scope of CON so that changes in bed capacity at two specific types of facilities would not require a CON. Okay. And those are the addictions treatment centers that we regulate and general hospices. Okay. Um, so we talked about hospices performed at a facility that is regulated, but then you also said that you regulate hospices in home health settings as well, too. Is that right? Or hospice services in home health settings? Home health agencies are, 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 different, are different a health care facility from general hospices, but we regulate both of those. Okay. Um, talking about service area, then, if... And, if a provider comes in and makes an application for a CON, I'm assuming that provider defines a geographical type of service area and the, the demographics that might be in their population, whatever is important. When uh, MHCC <coughs> makes a decision to grant that, does that kind of, let's say, lock down that service area for that applicant 
and in a sense preclude anybody else from coming into that? Or could they use that same demographics in order to make their application? We have overlapping authorized service areas for most home health agencies and hospices. So the fact that Hospice A is authorized to serve three jurisdictions, that doesn't mean that other hospices aren't also approved to serve some of those same jurisdictions, maybe all of those jurisdictions. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not exclusive to single facilities. It's, we're, not, we're not creating exclusive carved out service areas for this facility and a different service area for this facility. There are overlaps. You might not be creating that, but if a CON is granted to somebody to provide that service and then somebody else wants to come in, you are going to take a look at who is already there providing that service, sure. right? Is there, is there any type of time frame on once a CON is approved before somebody that now holds that ability to provide those services in that geographic area has to take action? I think we actually, um, for both home health agencies and hospices, have a period of time after we approve uh, a, a new facility and that facility goes into operation. We don't go back to that same area and create a review cycle until that facility has operated for three years. So we give them a little bit of time to get established, to establish some market share and get operating before we introduce new competitors into that same area. Right, but if, if the first applicant has stalled and not moved forward, is there any type of time frame or conversation that has and says, you know, MHCC has awarded this, you have not started the process to get underway and begin, you know, obviously there's been a lot of changes since the, COVID, the pandemic, right, where, as we've talked about already, staffing uh, is, is very difficult to find. Somebody had plans to go and do something can't find the staffing to get started, now has somewhat abandoned plans, how difficult is it to get somebody in to take over that or be approved for that CON in that service area? We have performance requirements in our procedural regulations for all different types of CONs. So you actually, a CON has a shelf life. You got to implement it within a certain period of time or it uh, is voided. And that happens sometimes. For, for hospices and home health agencies, it's 18 months. Okay. So 18 months after you uh, receive a CON to establish one of those types of agencies, you need to get licensed in operating okay. or else the CON is voided. And in, during the pandemic, we did, uh, on an emergency basis, extend some of those performance requirements because it was uh, an unusual and chaotic time. Uh, those of all... Uh, passed at this point, so we're back to our, our regular performance requirements. But we did give give uh, facilities who had CONs and were in the process of implementing them additional time in 2020 and 2021. All right, that's very helpful. Um, thank you very much. And just since uh, Ben brought up um, our, our efforts to expand at least primary care physicians in rural areas. Um, Madam Chair, if I could just take one moment to, to thank um, uh, Dr. Gerald at University of Maryland in Baltimore, and I know Susan Lawrence is here as well, that helped us implement that Eastern Shore Rural Re Re Residency Program. And um, we certainly appreciate all their efforts. And Madam Chair, as you know, all good programs need to be funded. And uh, we want to make sure that the rural health, rural health care and uh, that area of the state is very important and continues to be within uh, the state of Maryland. Thank you, Senator. I'm confident you'll make those needs known right across the hall. Thank you for that. Uh, Vice Chair. I think you did just did make that known. <laughs> But uh, now my question is, um, we have the five new freestanding medical facilities. Are they all finished or they're, they're done? The one conversion of a hospital to a freestanding medical facility that is not done is uh, in Harford County. So Harford Memorial um, in 
cover to grace will be uh, replaced with a new outpatient campus in Aberdeen and that will be a freestanding medical facility with a special psychiatric hospital on the same site. Okay, and uh, I, so I guess when you're uh, creating the new freestanding medical facilities, it doesn't have to be built on the, like the hospital proper that you're not going to be using anymore. They within go, five miles. Within five miles, but all of them, none of the, the, the hospitals mentioned here, the freestanding facilities are not on that, those properties. In the case of Laurel, um, it's adjacent to the adjacent. hospital property, okay. so it's technically not on the same okay. site, but it's, it's, it's really yeah. across but the street. What? In the case of Grace Medical Center in Baltimore City, it is basically being uh, phased in as a, you know, the, the outpatient campus is, is kind of a phased redevelopment project, but it'll essentially be on the same campus. Okay. Um, and what, what do they do with the old old hospital buildings that's up to them that's have any of them going in to be office buildings or anything like that um, I don't know that I know the final disposition of okay. any of these hospitals that are being you know totally replaced okay. in in some cases for example Laurel um, they're no longer functioning as a hospital they haven't been for a couple of years, except for a period of time during the, the pandemic when they were an alternate care site hospital. But the existing hospital is still there, and the FMF is operating in the emergency room, the old emergency okay. room of that hospital. Oh, so it's still there. And they're okay. also doing some other outpatient services. They no longer admit patients as a okay. hospital. Uh, but that's a transition phase. They're, in, they're constructing a new uh, building which will actually serve as the new freestanding medical facility as I said across the street that'll be completed this summer uh, and again the Grace campus in Baltimore City a very similar thing there the uh, initially the the existing hospital emergency room was functioning as the freestanding medical facility I think that's also the case in Chrisfield with that facility okay. And are, are there any other freestanding facilities in the future that you know of? There are none in our pipeline right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We will go to Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so just to get a, a better understanding of these freestanding medical facilities, are these just sim um, similar to, like, medical pavilions or surgery care centers? Or, or what, what do these freestanding facilities look like? They are freestanding emergency centers. They're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, medical direction has to be provided by a board-certified emergency medicine physician, and there has to be one such physician on site at, at all times. So um, they are very close in terms of the uh, the array of diagnostic and treatment services that one would see in a hospital emergency department. Yeah, I was going to say, so it sounds like it's just a, just the emergency department element of a hospital without the inpatient side. They are also allowed to have observation beds, like, okay, a, right. like a general hospital. So you can um, observe a patient um, like during a period of time in which you're trying to make a definitive right. diagnosis and decide whether they need to be admitted to a hospital. And in that case, they would be transferred from the FMF to the parent hospital. Okay. And I assume that these freestanding med medical facilities then have an affiliation for any inpatient admissions that they would transfer them to, or is that at the discretion of the patient? Or Under current state law, a FMF can only be developed by a general hospital that will serve as the parent hospital. So they would be transferred to that facility? Yes. The parent facility. Okay. They could be transferred to another facility, depending on what their needs are. Right, 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 if the services are provided at that mm -hmm. parent facility. Um, for the ongoing performance review of cardiac surgery and PCI programs, that seems to be new to the commission, I guess. It's, it, at least it seems like it's, it's different than the certificate of need and some of these other programs that the commission has traditionally looked into. This is really quality improvement, I think, at, it, at its heart, right? It's really looking at performance metrics and making sure that 
it's meeting some outcome measures when it comes to these specific procedures being done. Is that, is that my interpretation? That's true. Right. Okay. It's a combination of process and outcome measures that we look at in these reviews. And is the, is the commission intending to expand further into this quality and performance kind of realm, or is that something that may or may not come forward? I don't think we are at this point. Um, this arose, this change in the law, uh, which gave this new authority to MHCC, really arose uh, out of some issues with the appropriateness of PCI services. Um, and oh. this goes back some years um, to an era Whereas when we did not have, I don't think, the the criteria that we have now that have been developed by the ACC for use by physicians in deciding, okay, you know, when, when does a uh, coronary artery blockage really right. uh, uh, require? There were some uh, instances like about 10 years ago where yes. there was yes. some issues. Yes. So that was what really gave rose to this. Uh, yeah. there, there was a feeling that, well, we're regulating PCI, we're regulating cardiac surgery uh, at MHCC, maybe we, we need to have a, uh, a more systemic and formal monitoring of how they're performing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when it comes to facilities and certificates of need, um, Spring Grove Hospital used to be very close to my old district um, in terms of its proximity, and it's since been transferred over to, to UMBC. The certificate of need process, though, doesn't... Um, look at closures, number one, right, of, of facilities. And, you know, there's a need, obviously, for psychiatric beds in the state. That closure or that transfer could, be, could affect that in some way. Um, should, so one, it doesn't look at closures, I assume. And two, is our closure something that we should take a closer look at um, when it comes to need, particularly of psych beds? Well, I'm anticipating that the changes uh, that will occur at that campus, which we don't know what those are yet, um, may not necessarily be a simple closure. I'm, I'm assuming that there's going to be um, some redistribution of state psychiatric hospital bed, bed capacity, um, maybe, maybe even possibly retaining some psychiatric hospital bed capacity on that same campus in the future. But uh, I, it, it is true that we do not, uh, within the scope of CON regulation, require a CON to close a healthcare facility. Okay. I hope that you're right, and I hope <laughs> that they will look at the psychiatric bed needs in the state. Uh, you know, at least from my perspective, that was rolled out without much forethought into the future in terms of what that might look like. And so all of that is to be seen, and I hope we'll have a plan forthcoming soon on that. Um, last question has to do with um, the acquisitions piece, and it looks like right now um, acquisitions of healthcare facilities, as you mentioned, is not subject to certificate of need. It sounds as though this may be something the commission and the commissioners may want to issue forward a recommendation later on in forthcoming years to, to look at this a little bit further. Has there been, by extension from that, you know, we've been also hearing more concerns about uh, provider practices, physician practices being brought up, bought up by private equity firms and consolidated in that regard, similar to, but different obviously, to these acquisitions of healthcare facilities. Has that been something the commission has looked at? Is there any interest from the commission on that? Because I think there are, there are some growing national concerns about private equity firms buying up physician and provider practices. And we've heard those concerns, and obviously they can influence uh, healthcare facilities downstream, but um, we, we are, are not looking to expand uh, the certificate of need program specifically beyond health facilities regulation. So I think uh, the commission's interest in acquisitions is, uh, is broader than nursing homes, but the authority and the historic scope of CON would not, for example, cover physician practices, which you know, is an area of growing interest. You're absolutely right that uh, private equity's ap appetite for acquisition stretches uh, beyond nursing homes uh, and AMSURGE physician practices are you know, definitely um, near that top of that list. Uh, our authority is 
is non-existent in those areas. Right. But uh, clearly, uh, something to pay attention to moving forward. Right, and, and the concern obviously being if, if more of these practices were bought up by private equity to Senator Kramer's point, they really could be driving volume, um, perhaps at the detriment of quality and other issues, so. Correct. Right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mouse. Well, thank, thank you, Chairman. Am I live? Yes. Okay, I'll make sure. Uh, 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 my name's, I'm, I'm a new Senator, and uh, our district, is four counties in the midshore, and I have not had a lot of interaction uh, with the commission. I was just interested to know we've got issues uh, for every for every topic that was raised today. We've got uh, issues in, in, in that area. And I was wondering what would be the best way to communicate with the commission. Should I just call uh, the, the general number? Who would you prefer uh, in, uh, inquiries to go to? So. Uh, those, if you know, kind of hard to pigeonhole the questions for gen for general in inquiries. Uh, it can be to me uh, if it's you know we certainly have a. Uh, I, I'm sure you're aware of the uh, the uh, CON application that was recently submitted by um, Shore Health to replace Easton mm -hmm. Memorial. Uh, we are working through that in consultation with HSCRC. I, as I talked, touched on earlier, the issues of access to physicians. Uh, I am aware um, of the challenges that residents of, of the Midshore have in terms of finding a primary care physician. Uh, darn near impossible if you don't, quote unquote, know someone, uh, I think is what I would say. And you know, we're working with our colleagues to try to resolve some of the challenges of just simply access to primary care and specialty care physicians. And but what's the best way to reach you? I'll give you my contact information, uh, you. as well as Tracy DeShields' uh, contact. Thank you. You may know. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and thank you so much to this panel. I do have some questions, but I won't uh, lengthen this, this briefing. I'll follow up with you online. Just a little note, it's related to Prince George's County. Look forward to talking with Look you. Look forward to talking. I yes. bet you do. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you so much for all the information you provided. Yeah. Colleagues, we're going to turn now to the briefing from the Health Services Cost Review Commission. And so we'll invite Katie Wunderlich up. And you can bring whoever with you uh, that you like to complete your panel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Katie Wunderlich. I'm the Executive Director of the Health Services Cost Review Commission. It's great to be here before you today. I'm providing an overview of our commission as well as the aims and goals of our total cost of care model, the Maryland Health model um, that is running in the state that's advancing um, uh, better health outcomes, improved coordination of care delivery, reduced total cost of care, um, and improved health equity. So I'll touch on a, on, on a number of these um, uh, uh, throughout my presentation. So, um, oh, there we go. Just a brief bit about who we are. The Health Services Cost Review Commission is an independent state agency uh, we're responsible, our primary um, responsibility is regulating the cost and quality of hospital regulated services in the state. So our, our underlying and, and uh, primary regulatory task is setting rates for hospital inpatient and outpatient uh, services. How, however, as care delivery has expanded and evolved, um, so too has our um, um, so too has our role in healthcare delivery um, transformation. Um, so we are leading Maryland's um, total cost of care model, which I'll talk about a lot in a lot of details. But you know, really trying to advance um, quality of healthcare, patient experience, improve population health and health disparities, um, and reduce total cost of care for Marylanders. Um, a little bit about our unique healthcare system. So the Maryland Health Model. Um, 
is buttressed by two main elements. Um, on the left, the all-payer hospital rate setting system is in Maryland statute. Um, it's been there since the 1970s. That requires um, payers of hospital services to pay HSCRC regulated rates. Um, that has been in place since the 70s. Our model and our, our system has evolved, but one underlying fact has been this all-payer nature um, of our system. So that means that Medicare and Medicaid um, pay similar to the uh, commercials to commercials to um, uh, self-pay patients. So everybody pays the same amount for a particular service at a particular hospital. That service at different hospitals may have a, have a different price, but at, at, a hosp at one hospital, everybody, no matter what your payer type is, pays the same HSCRC rate. And that's really different than the rest of the country where um, in the rest of the country, Medicare and Medicaid pay well below costs. Um, and in order to make up that difference, hospitals shift that cost onto commercials. And so sometimes commercials pay 20, 30, 40 percent more um, than Medicare. But in, in Maryland, we, we have an all-payer rate setting system. And that's really been the backbone um, of our model. Uh, the other part uh, that is integral to this is our agreement with um, CMS and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. It is what provides and gives us a waiver from Medicare payment uh, payment rates and payment systems. So the agreement that we have with CMMI is what allows us to um, be waived from those Medicare payments um, to be able to set our own rates. But it also enables us to work on shared goals, um, not only to reduce total cost of care, but also to improve quality at the hospital and non-hospital setting to improve care transformation um, uh, to better serve Marylanders. And so that uh, the agreement with uh, CMMI really is the framework uh, that we are transforming care in Maryland. Um, so a couple of notes on the total cost of care model. Um, so we um, have had two model iterations with CMS and CMMI. The first one was the all-payer model that ran from 2014 to 2018. That was a hospital-based model. Now our total cost of care model uh, uh, runs from 2019 through 2028, and it really expands the reach, both cost and quality targets beyond just hospital cost and quality targets to non-hospital and population health-based targets. So here's just a, a small recap of, of the components. Um, at the very middle, uh, the center are the hospitals that do drive a lot of um, care delivery in communities across Maryland. Um, it's, of course, what the HSCRC has regulatory authority over. Our hospitals operate under a population-based or a global budget. Um, so that means that they have a revenue target at the beginning of the year that they know they will uh, be able to accrue a certain amount of revenue. And it allows them to um, reach out into their communities um, to improve patients' health and not rely on patients coming into the hospital to, to, um, to accrue revenue. Um, and so under the total cost of care model, of course, we're going beyond hospitals to the broader health care system. Um, and we are uh, um, developing programs, voluntary programs, that can align cost and quality targets for hospital and non-hospital providers. So for uh, physicians under the Maryland Primary Care Program and our EQUIP program, which is our bundled payment for specialists, um, we also have care transformation initiatives that hospitals um, uh, uh, take on. And it's all to advance value-based programs and, and align incentives um, between uh, across the care delivery spectrum. And then, of course, last but not least at all, the total cost of care model contemplates the whole of the Maryland community. How can we um, uh, better increase access to care, um, addressing chronic conditions and health management, um, and uh, population health improvement? And we've focused on three main population health focus areas. Um, although that's certainly not everything that hospitals are working on. Hospitals have community health needs assessments that they work on a number of issues um, for their communities. But as a state, we have identified diabetes, um, behavioral health, and maternal child health as three uh, focus areas of population health. And it really allows the state to focus on those three um, big issues that really impact communities across the state. 
um, and um, impact significantly um, communities that have uh, uh, fewer access to care um, and, and are underserved. Okay, um, the Maryland model, um, uh, we've had it in place since the 70s. It has evolved. It has produced a number of really important advantages um, to the state and to Marylanders. Um, first uh, is that we are aimed at controlling hospital cost growth while still improving quality and patient outcome. And so one does not happen without the other. We are um, uh, certainly trying to make the healthcare system more efficient um, so that there can be cost savings that can be re invested into the community. But we have um, very strong quality programs so that while we are, while hospitals are driving towards efficiency, we are not sacrificing patient outcomes or quality at the expense of that lower cost of care. Um, the second box, we are, we, the, Mar the Maryland Health Model guarantees equitable funding of uncompensated care. Um, this is one of the underlying um, initiatives of equity across the state. So what I mean by um, equitably funding uncompensated care, um, I mean that there are no public hospitals in Maryland. So there are no hospitals that are, um, uh, that are public hospitals. That means that any Marylander can go to any hospital that they choose, regardless of payer status. And so um, when a patient who is uninsured or underinsured goes to um, the hospital to receive services, um, so some of that, if they are uninsured or underinsured, meaning that they can't um, uh, pay their, their bills, goes into an uncompensated care Fund And so hospitals that serve large portions um, of uninsured and underinsured patients um, share equitably that the burden, the cost um, across the state. Um, it really is one of the underlying elements of equity that the model produces. I've also talked about the, the stability of the global budget revenue targets. Um, uh, the GBRs does do produce um, a significant amount of stability and predictability for hospital um, budgets. That's especially important in rural areas uh, where volumes could be low. Um, so it allows, it protects that revenue for that rural community. It's also been really important through COVID-19 um, when we've seen very um, significant fluctuations in volume, the global budgets allow the hospitals to know what their, um, their revenue target is and not have to worry about having to drive patients in. So that, that, that stability and predictability has been really important through COVID-19. I've talked about the um, all-payer rate setting system and then um, supporting population health and health equity initiatives. We're able to drive specific and targeted investments um, in population and health and health equity, and I'll talk about those um, in just a minute. I talked about our quality program. So we look at cost and quality targets. So we are not just looking at reducing total cost of care. We also have rigorous quality programs. And there's two things I'd like to, to take away, for you all to take away um, from these remarks. The Maryland Health Model allows um, Maryland hospitals to be exempt from federal programs. Um, the federal programs are Medicare only. Their quality programs are for Medicare population only. Our quality programs um, that reduce complications, um, uh, reduce readmissions, and improve patient safety and quality, they are all payer in nature. So they are not, hospitals are not just evaluated on their Medicare patients. They, it is an all payer quality system. So we are driving higher quality for everybody across the system. Um, the second thing I want to take away is that because of our model, because we are exempt from the federal programs, we are able to tailor our quality programs um, for uh, issues that are specific to Maryland. And so one, two examples that I have, um, uh, we have added emergency department wait times to our quality programs. We added them in, in 2019, um, knowing that they have been and continue to be a longstanding challenge. In nationally, there is not uh, emergency department wait times in the, the federal program, but because we have an exemption, we're able to add additional things. We know we have a significant work to do on emergency department wait times, and so the commission wanted to add that reward and penalty for emergency department. The other um, important uh, um, addition that we were able to make this past year was we added a disparity measure. And so Maryland hospitals, we are the first in the nation 
to add a disparity measure onto our hospital quality programs. And um, it speaks to the uh, flexibility that we have under the model. It speaks to the way that we can tailor and drive um, uh, to, the, to the extent that we are, are driving towards better health, uh, health equity across the state. We added a health disparity measure to our quality program. So really excited about that. Um, paired with our quality programs is what's known as state, the statewide integrated health improvement strategy. It's also shorthand is known as, as SIHIS. Um, and SIHIS is um, when we entered into the total cost of care model, we expanded beyond just hospital quality. And we're really looking at care transformation across the system, enrolling more um, Marylanders in value-based programs, more dollars under value-based accountability. Um, and then importantly, um, focusing on those population health goals and po population health areas around diabetes, um, opioids and maternal and child health. Um, a couple of comments on our other care transformation programs. I mentioned the one in the middle, which is EQUIP. Um, this is a um, a voluntary program that that we that the HSCRC has developed. It's a voluntary to um, uh, physicians to engage in um, uh, a bundle payment program. So there are four specialists for specific uh, bundles. And it engages, so we don't have regulatory authority over physicians. We only have regulatory authority over hospitals. But we do have the ability to work with CMMI to produce certain waivers um, that can, uh, so that we can craft programs that other non-hospital providers would, could opt into on a voluntary basis. Um, primary care, um, the primary care program is a, an integral part of the total cost of care model. Um, it is run uh, on, on the state side and within MDH on the program management office. Um, it is a way that we are um, reinvesting in primary care practices in the um, transformation um, uh, of primary care practices. Um, it's been a significant um, success in, in Maryland in terms of the number of primary care practices that are engaged and the number of enrollees, uh, Medicare enrollees that are enrolled. I will also mention we, um, uh, both for the, physician, the specialist program and for primary care, we're looking to make sure we align those Medicare programs with Care First um, and other commercials so that a, a physician who's operating in MDPCP or in the equip um, has similar cost and quality targets across their uh, patient um, panel. Um, emergency department wait times, um, this is a significant issue that is long standing. We, um, as a state, have had excessive um, wait times compared to the nation for decades, um, uh, for a, a very long time. CMS used to uh, publish a national emergency department wait time data. They've discontinued that, but we are replacing that with our own electronic quality measures. Um, we know that this is a longstanding issue and we're continuing to to figure out what other steps the commission could take. Certainly, there are other agencies and, and, and health system uh, actors that can also can, that also can help to, to address this. But we've done a few things. We've worked with MIMS. We added those ED performance measures, as I mentioned, to our quality programs. We've provided seed funding for mobile integrated health and EMS um, both treat at the scene and um, delivery to an alternative care destination. And then finally, our regional partnerships um, that focus on behavioral health offer crisis services um, that are um, uh, aimed at reducing emergency department um, utilization so that patients can access care that need behavioral health services outside of the emergency department setting. I want to take a couple minutes to talk about our health equity and population health initiatives. I touched on most of these already through SIHIS, through our hospital quality program. Um, uh, we are always looking at um, improving and evolving our data and hospital reporting. Um, of course, I mentioned our, the uncompensated care fun fund and um, collaboration with state agencies. We're really trying to make sure this is a focal point in everything we do, not just one program, but uh, across, our, uh, across our rate setting authority. Um, 
there are two specific ways that we have directed statewide funding. So the all-payer rate setting system, we've been able to earmark um, statewide funds for particular and specific uh, population health initiatives. And so there are um, two that I want to talk about. The first one is the Regional Partnership Catalyst uh, Program. Um, and these are, there are two funding streams for this Regional Partnership Catalyst Program. The idea is to um, encourage hospitals to work together in common service areas and to work with their community-based organizations and community-based providers to um, uh, advance better health in, in two areas. One, diabetes prevention and management, and two, behavioral health crisis services. And um, it's a five-year program. It's a significant amount of money over those five years. 86 million to the six diabetes proposals and 79 million to the three behavioral health um, proposals. There are a number of hospitals uh, engaged and community partners. And it's, it's a demonstration of how we can um, direct our state funds, our state rate setting funds to particular um, population health uh, areas that we are trying to address as a state. Um, the other um, uh, special fund programming area is under maternal and child health. That, this one is a little different um, for diabetes and behavioral health. Those were competitively bid and awarded to hospitals. Um, this is the maternal and child health funding was also statewide revenue, but it was directed to MDH um, through their, uh, in their Medicaid program, environmental health, and um, public health. So this is um, uh, uh, aimed at, it's a, a $40 million in cumulative funding um, to Medicaid and public health to address maternal mortality and morbidity and um, childhood asthma. And this was also, so you know, we wanted, we made a specific choice when we were looking at population health goals. We did not want to have population health goals that were just would just benefit Medicare or would just benefit one segment of our population. We wanted to make sure that our population health goals were ran across, uh, across the spectrum. And so we purposefully chose maternal and child health. Um, those are two uh, um, patient populations that are not in Medicare, but we wanted to make sure we were driving population health improvements uh, for everyone in Maryland. Um, uh, one last advantage of the model, as I mentioned, there's no cost shifting in Maryland, um, and so Medicare and Medicaid pay uh, uh, higher, um, uh, true to cost, higher in Maryland than in other states. So in other states, remember, Medicare and Medicaid pay well below cost. Um, and this is really important for rural hospitals and high poverty hospitals, hospitals that have a large share of public payer, of public, um, publicly enrolled patients, so patients that are Medicare or Medicaid. Um, so because Medicare and Medicaid pay uh, uh, higher rates than the nation the mo uh, through the model, that provides significant um, additional dollars and revenues to those hospitals to treat patients in, um, in, those, in those areas. And so we looked at, we compared um, for rural hosp hospitals in rural counties, we compared um, hospitals that, deliver, that, that operated in rural counties in Maryland to hospitals in rural counties nationally. We compared the level of reimbursement um, and uh, per enrollee Medicare and Medicaid hospitals in Maryland receive about $848 more per enrollee or about 300 million. So it does provide, it allows, the Maryland model allows additional revenue um, to come into the state uh, and, and serve that population. For counties with high levels of deep poverty, we also did that comparison. Um, what do hospitals that are operate in counties with uh, high levels of deep poverty, how do they compare to um, national? Um, and the, the, the difference was even starker there, um, almost a billion or a billion dollars more in revenue from those higher, uh, higher payments at that 1,770 per enrollee. So, um, you know, wanting to make sure we are um, uh, protecting our model for a number of reasons, but not least of which is because it allows us to keep and retain um, investments in uh, rural and high poverty areas. 
Um, a couple of things on our model performance. Um, we are required to meet certain targets and certain um, uh, uh, financial and quality targets in order to keep the Maryland model with CMMI. We have cost and quality targets both. I wanna focus on the cost uh, uh, targets um, that we have to meet. We, we are required to build up to $300 million in annual total cost of care savings and um, that our total cost of care growth um, should not be above the nation um, uh, by more than 1% or by any amount two years in a row. And, and so we all, you know, we have quality targets as well, but I just want to focus just for a minute on those financial because we do have some significant, um, a, a significant performance uh, uh, challenge. And I'm sorry, this, the, the slide isn't formatted well. I hope your printed out copies are formatted better than the ones that are projected. But um, this shows year over year from 2018 to 2022, Maryland is in the blue bars or the US is in the orange bars, you can see in 2018, 19, and 20, we consistently were, had a lower, a lower growth of total cost of care than the nation. So just to orient you, in 2018, we grew by 2.2% year over year, the nation grew by 3.5%. In 2019, uh, Maryland grew on a total cost of care basis by 3.39%, where the, the nation grew 4%. Um, so we have been able to contain the growth of our costs such that we are below the nation. How, and, and, and as such, we've been able to build up our annual run rate, which is the line, that orange-yellow line. However, there has been um, performance challenges in 22. Um, so you can see there's kind of a steep cliff there in 22, um, where our total cost of care growth has been about 4.37% um, compared to the national growth of only 1.8%. And so, this, so there's a couple of reasons for this. One, the nation has had unusually low um, uh, total cost of care growth. So, and, and some of the reasons behind that, there's high staffing costs. So hospitals outside of Maryland um, who operate on a fee-for-service basis, if the cost to deliver a service, the cost to provide that nurse or the anesthesiologist or what be, whatever that might be, if that cost is too high, higher than the reimbursement, they may choose not to offer that service. They may choose to close units. They may choose not to offer that procedure. Um, in, in nationally, it has resulted in very, very low growth. Um, in Maryland, we have growth about what we anticipated, but we just didn't anticipate that low um, uh, national growth. So we have some work to do to get ourselves back on track um, and back onto a favorable performance. Um, we have taken some actions to date to reduce the all-payer all payer rate reduction, um, to request some Medicare-only payment reductions, to increase our public payer differential, which provides savings to Medicare and Medicaid, and to request a, deficit, a reduction in the Medicaid deficit assessment, which I want to thank Governor Moore for including um, in, in his budget um, uh, for fiscal 24. Um, just to orient you on the timeline, we are currently in um, model year five, 2023. Our model runs technically through 2028, but really through 2026 is the end of the performance period. And, and we, we are um, starting on um, uh, a process to uh, think about what do we want as a state moving forward? What is our vision for the future so that we can work with CMMI well in advance of that 2026 end date uh, for a favorable, uh, favorable outcome for Maryland and the model? That concludes my, um, my remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I'd also be happy to follow up um, if to the extent that we don't have time to get to all the questions. I'd be happy to follow up individually. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have Senator Vidal, Senator Ellis, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Katie, thank you so much for your presentation. Every time I, um, I hear a presentation on, on all payer, I learn more, so I, I appreciate that. Um, you, you started, I think, touch on this, and that's we're seeing in our hospitals the cost of travel nurses mm -hmm. has really increased the cost of care. Will that be addressed as you set the rates for the coming year? Uh, yes, thank you for that question, Senator. It, it, 
the agency nurses have been a significant cost to hospitals, starting as early as 2021 when um, they were needed to go between COVID hospitals. But even now with the staffing shortages, the workforce challenges, um, uh, Maryland hospitals have had to rely on um, eight nurse agencies that have a significantly higher rate than um, their permanent staff. Um, I'm happy to say that the, our Maryland hospitals have done a lot to engage with their, their permanent staffs, increasing um, the, their hourly rate, um, providing other incentives. Um, so that's really, you know, when we think about a stable delivery system, it really is with a stable workforce as well. Um, so some of the agency um, costs have started to come down a little bit, but it certainly is, it, it eats into um, Maryland hospitals operating budgets when they have to spend more on those, uh, that workforce. We've, we've done some things in the past, um, last, uh, fis for fiscal year 23, we did add an additional 40 basis points of inflation to address those workforce challenges, to address the, the additional costs that hospitals are incurring. So we have, have made some adjustments there, um, uh, but it's a challenge for sure, um, an ongoing challenge. Ma Madam Chair, can I keep going? <laughs> Thank you. Um, the emergency department wait time. Um, we, we sort of touched on this with one of Senator Lamb's questions about behavioral health, but in the hospital that's in my area, I know one of the issues is there's no place to place these patients that have behavioral health crisis, so they're in beds in the emergency room. Is there any planning going forward for how we can address that bed shortage? Yes, uh, there has been a lot of uh, a lot of concerted effort. There was um, on the house side a. a, a behavioral health bed registry and uh, work group to, to look at that. We have some specific funding initiatives specifically for behavioral health that attempts to address both um, uh, provide uh, in, um, funding for patients to, to have access in other parts of the delivery system besides the emergency department because somebody who's in a behavioral health crisis going into the emergency department is not the right place to treat that behavioral health crisis. So we want to make sure we're, um, there, there are other access points um, that are available specifically for behavioral health. And my last question is just real quick on maternal health. There's a lot of our doctors that don't even know we have programs like this in the health department. So I'd like to have an offline conversation with you about how we can get the word out about the home visits and the different ways that we can help women that aren't getting the services that, that they need during their pregnancy. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Ellis. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, uh, Director, for your testimony. Um, so uh, this committee a few years ago passed the uh, doula bill, which is now I'm, good to, I'm happy to see that it's on the uh, list of maternal care. And your testimony talked about reimbursement for doula services. So if you could expand a bit on that, because I've received feedback saying that the reimbursement isn't really where it should be. Have you looked at that, and do you have any data on the participants uh, in this particular you know, service? Um, thank you for that question. It's an important um, additional uh, suite of services that, that Medicaid is now offering, and so I think that the the, pers the experts would be Medicaid in terms of what their reimbursement is on doula services. For the HSCRC, we were able to take um, statewide dollars and uh, uh, um, direct it to Medicaid for that purpose. So I'd like to follow up with Medicaid on terms of what their doula reimbursement amounts are. They they'd be the right people. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. Senator Lamb, then Reedy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Wunderlich. Um, I'd like to focus, I guess, on these last couple slides because my concern stems from our waiver and um, the concerns that have stemmed from the last couple years, obviously, because um, if we are not able to sustain this waiver and, and um, continue to have it with CMS and CMMI, that everything that you um, presented earlier falls apart. Right. This whole program disappears and goes away if we can't sustain our waiver. And so looking at this chart, it looks like for the last two years, we have blown past our guardrails. And I think on the previous slide, you cite that we have to be at less than 3.58% per capita annually of all payer hospital revenue growth, which we were in 2018, 2019, and certainly in 2020. But then now 
most recently in 21, we were at 10.13%, right? And then 4.37% uh, in 2022, both of which have exceeded the 3.58%. Am I, am I reading that correctly? Um, so the 3.58% is the all, so what you're seeing here is Medicare total cost of care. Mm, okay. um, the 3.58 governs our all, all payer, payer hospital revenue growth. But I, I think your your comments are still, um, they're still appropriate because we have we have seen um, better performance than the nation. And sometimes when we pre present this, we combine 20 and 21 because there was so much um, uh, volume, volatility, and anomalies happening between uh, March 20 and, you know, as, as COVID began. Um, uh, but we've been able to be well below the nation in 18, 19, and 20. You're right, in 21, we were slightly over. However, we were only, we were 64 basis points over, so we were technically still within our guardrail because we aren't supposed to be more than 1% above. Hmm. Um, but, it, but it eroded our annual run rate level. Now we are... Um, we're three percent over. We'll, you know, maybe we'll be two and a half percent over when, when all is said and done. Oh yeah, two point five four. Here it is. So we're, we're trending in the wrong direction. We are trending in the wrong direction, but um, there, I. The question is: Is this um, a permanent new? Is this a permanent change in volume patterns, or is this uh, a temporary change until um, until the, the COVID abnormalities sort themselves out between the staffing, uh, workforce costs? Um, you know, um, so the question is, is it permanent or temporary? Um, we certainly are taking actions that the actions that we took on the next slide take out $100 million in Medicare revenue and help to get us back on track. Um, so we are taking it seriously. We took proactive actions. Um, we aren't technically um, required to take actions until CMMI um, uh, uh, validates that we have um, this negative performance, which won't come till April or May. We acted in December, so we acted proactively to take out Medicare dollars. Um, I think part of this will be a temporary, um, not that volumes will rebound nationally, but that there will be some to the extent that agency nurse costs lessen and, and staffing can equalize. There, there could be some little bit of rebounding um, in the nation. It, but it is a, it's a significant um, and serious issue. We've been taking it very seriously. We've been working with CMMI. We've been working with um, our congressional delegation uh, and others to make sure we're taking the appropriate steps so that we aren't jeopardizing the waiver. Um, and I think there is um, joint investment between the federal government and Maryland in the Maryland health model. It has been, with the exception of 22, a, an enormously successful model to transform care to, to go towards value-based care instead of volume-based care. Um, it's been a significantly um, successful model, and so I think we both jointly have um, an invested interest in trying to make sure we're riding the ship in an appropriate way. And um, as a follow-up to that, you cite that the actions that were taken on the next slide, it, is the interpretation, when I look at these actions, it, it looks like the hospitals are being asked to take a few haircuts here and there. That, uh, you know, when it comes to the all-payer rate reduction, 40 million down. When it comes to hospital revenues, reduction by 64 million, a $50 million reduction in special funding to hospitals to Medicaid in that last um, section. I guess those are the course corrections that, that have been undertaken so far, and I assume that the hospitals have, and health systems have agreed to this to try to bring that curve back in line, right? They have, yes. So um, you're correct. Um, many of these hit hospitals directly. The all-payer rate reduction is, is um, it reduces that revenue by $40 million. The Medicare payment also is a direct hit to, to Medicare, or to, to hospitals. The public payer differential is, is a little different because it actually asks, so it, it um, reduces Medicare and Medicaid rates and increases, makes a corresponding increase to commercial rates. Um, by that same amount. We're doing it on a temporary basis because we don't want to make it permanent, but we do. We were asking, as we were looking for actions. We wanted we wanted all of the healthcare stakeholders to have some ownership. So hospitals were taking some ownership in the, in the correction. Um, commercial payers through the public payer differential are responsible for an additional 50 million. So that's not on, um, on hospitals. And then the reduction in the Medicaid deficit assessment 
um, to the extent that that stays in place, we will be able to reduce hospital remittance by 50 million. So that that's kind of a um, a credit back to them for their other payment reductions. But but you're right, there there is some significant um, rate reductions. Uh, um, and payment reductions for Maryland hospitals. And I guess the final follow-up from that then is, you know, these reductions are not insignificant, obviously, when you look at this. And um, it's not as though these hospitals had a, a bunch of money that was just sitting around to, to spare. And so this is, this, the reductions are going to be meaningful in some way in terms of potential programs and services. What do you expect those reductions to lead to in terms of um, programs, services, and other um, meaningful uh, clinical reductions that you might see at a hospital, and two, is the HSCRC monitoring that so that when we see these numbers um, going down and hospitals receiving less funding, that someone in the state is actually monitoring the impact there? Yeah, sure. Um, so we do collect financial data from hospitals, both monthly financial data and annual audited um, financial data. Um, so we do look at the, the um, financial performance of hospitals. Um, the, the good thing um, leading up to these actions that we're taking, we've been under a global budget system since 2014, which has allowed hospitals to have a 2013-based um, uh, budget that's been inflated over the years. Um, they've also been able to reduce their utilization um, uh, pretty significantly, which is a great thing, which is what we're looking to them, for them to do. But they've been able to keep the balance of that. So, that, so hospitals since 2013 have been able to generate um, uh, savings along the way. So that's you know kind of the the one the good thing that offsets these kind of hard times. And and there are um, hospitals are cer certainly in. Um, uh, uh, difficult financial circumstances, as hospitals nationally also are. I, I would say that our hospitals in Maryland are, are a little bit better placed because of the global budget system and because of the model, but but not immune at all to uh, the challenges um, that, that hospitals nationally face. Okay, thank you. And, and I think I would like to do a little bit of a deeper dive on mm -hmm. this, so maybe if we can follow up and have, you know, some additional briefing information on this part specifically. I know the chair, I think, is interested in this as well, and so we'll, we'll follow up. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam you. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Reedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for being here. Good, pre Great presentation. It's always very dense and very important. Um, I know when I've been meeting with, you know, our, we meet with our hospitals and other folks, other stakeholders before session, and so obviously the issue of uh, exactly what you're talking about with the, the costs rising and the concern about the medic about the waiver uh, was certainly part of that conversation. I had a couple of questions. Um, one is on hospital wait times, uh, is it possible that if we're keeping cost artificially low because we're trying to do this whole model that the whole waiver is built on, is that going to start, is that part of what's happening is that's catching up to us is that we've kept cost artificially low so when you restrict costs, you then, you know, when you restrict the when you restrict costs, you then restrict access, right? Eventually, are we? Or is there a concern that that's what might be happening somewhat? Yeah. So we looked at this in 2018 because that concern was brought up that global budgets um, may incentivize closure of right. units. Right. Um, the ED wait times have long, long predated uh, 2014. So we there was a presentation by MIMS um, that they they brought back up their report from 2000, the year 2000. So. So it, it, the emergency department wait times and the wait times at hospitals have um, long predate in Maryland have in been Maryland too high for uh, higher been, than the average for a long time. Yeah, higher okay. than the nation. Um, uh, so, uh, but even so, even you know, even given that this has been a long-standing issue, even so, we do want to make sure that we uh, look for unintended consequences. Uh, that what you're saying, because we don't want to just drive down cost growth without thinking about what is the implication for patient access, quality, outcomes. And so that's why we added that emergency department wait time to our quality program so that we could make sure we were seeing are some hospitals, are their wait times increasing, are they decreasing? We, 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 did, we for sure are looking to guard against those unintended consequences through those programs. Well, because especially if the hospitals end up having to take a haircut here in the future, it's going to continue to exacerbate some of, these, some of these other issues. That's good that that's part of that. Um, when you talked about the last couple of years have been rough as we look at the numbers, 
I remember it, uh, when I had a discussion with my hospital, it was almost like a, dis a thought of, can there be a waiver for the waiver? <laughs> because, you know, 2021 and 22, in your view, are we st we're dealing in some ways with the aftermath of some of the over, the, the over caution mm -hmm. from 2020, where you couldn't go to the hospital, you couldn't get preventative care for a long time. Is it fair to say that's part of what's driven now mm -hmm. this, ex this explosion in costs? Uh, so I think what you're what you're referring to the waiver from the waiver um, is what's referred to as exogenous factors and so in our contract um, there is an exogenous factors clause so if there's something that happens with the federal government with the correct. federal government yeah, yeah. if something happens that's outside of our control um, uh, <laughs> I which, think this would qualify <laughs> yes um, and so we actually did get an exogenous factors exemption on one of our quality um, uh, uh, programs our quality yeah. results um, but we're that this is what we're entertaining what what kinds of corrective actions do we need to do um, so that we can uh, um, so that so that that exogenous factors clause comes into place so that we can have some leniency with the with the federal government with or other understanding factors, with other factors as well correct with, like with the, the finance yes yeah, with the financial okay. factors okay and then the last question and this is certainly you're not the one that is responsible for this directly but we are talking about workforce uh, do we know that uh, has everyone in hospitals with especially with a nursing shortage has everyone that was terminated for vaccine hesitancy have they been rehired have they been given the opportunity to rehire yeah that would be a good question for the hospital association i, I don't i don't have that information on i figured but thank you very much thanks thank you madam chair thank you senator we'll go to vice chair klausmeyer I thought when you got to be vice chair, you could do your own button. <laughs> no, I'll get it straight one day. Now, I, in looking through the material, um, we did the maternal health care. We did the opioid and the diabetes. Those are your three main things. And then when we got to the page where you had the bad graph where you said, and that, but then you came to the part about Medicare being, we're taking a hit on that. Are we doing anything to try to stabilize that through the whole system, to try to stabilize our seniors? And you have those three main things, but as a senior, I worry about the other seniors. So does sure. that all make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. So a clarification on our targets with the federal government. Our financial targets um, are are Medicare based. So we have, and that's Medicare total cost of care. So when we were looking at that scary chart, that is Maryland's Medicare Part A and Part B growth compared to national Medicare. So those are, we do have one financial metric that's all payer, which is our all payer hospital revenue growth. Uh, but for the most part, those financial targets that we have to hit are Medicare specific, different than our quality programs, which are all payer. Um, and so um, um, to the extent that we're trying to turn around the financial, we are looking specifically at making sure we're hitting our the Medicare growth. Um, we've had um, uh, under the population health and the, the focus on improving access to care and outcomes, um, we are specifically looking at diabetes, um, behavioral health, uh, two of which can significantly impact the senior population. Maternal child health, obviously not. Um, but we also are incentivizing our hospitals to do more um, care coordination, um, care management, identifying um, patients in their communities that uh, come into the hospital regularly, so that they can address seniors that are that 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 have uh, that need care coordination or um, are high utilizers. Okay. And I just you know, in watching TV and seeing all the commercials for the, that's Medicare C, uh, Medicare Advantage, Advantage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now. The question I have, is there any way that do you, is there information through your organization so that if a senior calls me and says, I just don't know what to do because, you know, we, we got Joe Namath and we got this one and that one. I mean, I never know what to say to them. 
so I think the Maryland Insurance Administration would be a good. We do not um, regulate okay. insurers, and our cost targets right now do not include Medicare Advantage. But that's not to say that Medicare Advantage is not an important part important option that could be available to seniors. And so we've had a few things. Uh, we've had a, a grant program that we distributed over two years to help improve the quality of MA programs. Um, the state, the, the, this, this body has also provided additional um, grant dollars to Medicare Advantage. And so it's, it's an important uh, it's an important part of the overall health care landscape. Um, it's, a ch it's challenging. Medicare Advantage is, is his, has low uptake and low enrollment. And I think we need to work with our federal partners, the state, we as the collective, we, the state needs to work with the federal partners to see what other solutions there might be um, to increase enrollment of MA. So you think that'll help kind of like stabilize it and get it moving better? Um, I, you know, I'm hopeful, um, uh, but you know, I don't, I don't have, I'm not sure, I'm hopeful that it, that it will. It, it's going to take significant work with our federal partners um, uh, to, to come up with some solutions. Mm -hmm. um, well, you've got a lot of solutions you have to figure <laughs> out about the emergency rooms and now this. And so thank you for all your hard work and thank you for putting the acronyms in, in the back. And I am going to make flashcards and <laughs> the chair and I are going to you know, quiz the rest of the committee. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you so much for your responses and your presentation. I know you've had a very long afternoon, so I will follow up along with Senator Lamb on a couple of items. And of course, I'll also follow up on my beloved Prince George's County. So with that, members, that concludes the briefings for today. Please enjoy your evening. Be safe and see you tomorrow.